record now. Um, and yeah, I'll start off by uh, introducing Effective Altruism and Effective Altruism Cambridge. Um, so in the Effective Altruism community, uh, we try to answer one simple question. How can we use our resources to help others the most? Uh, one way we try to do this is by using evidence and careful analysis to, pick, th to think about the biggest problems in the world um, uh, and of those problems, what the most promising and neglected solutions might be. Uh, and then follow through in trying to enact those solutions with our careers, donations, and political choices. And Effective Altruism Cambridge is a community of people who follow these principles and are trying to do the most good. And uh, we host talks such as this one, as well as fellowships, reading groups, uh, mentoring, and socials. Um, and yeah, if you'd like to learn more, uh, check out our website, which I'll post in the chat. And also, uh, Asha, who is who's here today, uh, has created an excellent magazine that you should definitely check out. Uh, we are very, very excited about it. Um, and now I will uh, introduce our speaker today. Um, Rob is a graduate of Cambridge University, where he studied chemical engineering and has an MBA from Harvard. He was inspired to found the Against Malaria Foundation by a previous charity effort, a three-person fundraising swim for a 90% burns victim, which accidentally developed into 150 swims in 75 countries involving 10,000 people, which is pretty crazy. Um, he then scaled up this model, starting uh, the Against Malaria Foundation in 2005, and has now raised more than 345 million US dollars, funding 160 million anti-mosquito bed nets to protect 300 million people in 35 countries, mainly in Africa, all very large numbers. Uh, and these nets can be expected to have saved around 125,000 lives, avert 100 million cases of malaria, and improve the local economies by 4 billion US dollars. And he was recently awarded an MBA from Her Majesty the Queen for services to medicine and charity, and lives in London with his wife, Catherine, and their four children. Uh, I would now like to warmly welcome Rob to give a presentation on his incredible work with the Against Malaria Foundation. Thank you very much, Jerry. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so let me uh, share screen um, and hopefully you will be able to nod at me, Dewey, to say that you can see this because I can see your, great, you can see that. Um, so what I intend to do over the next 25 minutes is give you an idea of what we do at AMF and how we do it. And if there were only two words that you took away or associated with AMF at the end of those 25 minutes or the hour if people stay for questions, it would be the words impact and accountability impact because I think we'd all agree that every charity has to have a, I hope, a pretty clear idea of what impact they um, intend to have. Um, and we'll come on to that in a few minutes in terms of what that focus is for us. What is very important to us at AMF is accountability and delivering that impact. Um, if we can't know that the things that we're doing are happening, well, then we're sort of lost, really. Um, and so uh, I hope you'll see that through this presentation, accountability sits at the heart of effectively everything we do, because it guides our choices, our strategy, strategies, our decisions, and what we do each day. So without further ado, let me um, take you on to, if I can hit the right button to move the slides on, which they're not, uh, that's not so far, it has now. So um, you can read this page faster than I can say it. And what I hope you'll take away from it is the numbers are, huge. Um, 400,000 people dying a year, 200 million people at least falling sick each year. Um, you know, this is a humanitarian issue. Um, but it's not just a humanitarian issue, it's an economic issue. Because when people are sick, they can't teach, they can't drive, they can't farm, they can't function. And that means they don't contribute to their local societies. And if we want to help Africa out of the situation it finds it in, if I can put it in that rather general way, then fixing malaria is high on the list, if not at the top of the list, because it is one of the greatest single drags on the economy of Africa. Um, and if we can free up an awful lot of money that currently goes into um, funding health services by fixing malaria, that'd be a really good thing to do. Um, there is no silver bullet, there's no vaccine. Um, there's no solution that is easily rolled out. And Although vaccines have been researched and there is progress being made um, and progress has been made over the last 30 years, we still don't have a vaccine and it is sort of binary. You either have one or you don't. I mean, there are there is one vaccine, having said all that, that is being used in a certain group of 
um, people in, in young children, um, but there are complexities and it's not, I, I think we would all agree, it's not the answer right now. So there isn't a, there isn't a vaccine that we can deploy. Um, and if I turn to the two of the most affected groups, children under five and pregnant women, children under five because their immune systems are developing, pregnant women because their immune systems are somewhat compromised um, when a woman was, is pregnant, um, they're particularly at risk. And if we look at that, that under five population, it represents um, a very large number of people dying each day. And that would equate to something like the equivalent of two jumbo jets, two 747s, full of under fives dying every day. So to take some of these numbers that are often very abstract because they're very large, if I invited all of you down to the end of your local runway and we watched this happen, and I said, same time tomorrow and the next day and the next day, I think we'd all agree that this is, well, I use the word slaughter um, because it is, it's horrible um, to think that this is happening. But it is happening and it's happening every day. Um, it's just, it's not outside our window. It's often not um, near where we all live. Um, but no less terrible for that. But the good news is that when we think of malaria and how to solve it, fix it, do something about it, um, a very significant, if not the most significant thing we can do is to have people sleep under the humble bed net. Um, each net costs about $2 and protects two people when they sleep at night. And these nets are incredibly effective. Um, they're laced with insecticides, safe for people sleeping inside. And because they have that insecticide on them, even though in the environments in which they're distributed, they inevitably become ripped and there are holes and tears, because the mosquito doesn't do an aerobatics maneuver through a hole, it lands on the net and migrates to the hole. We can, and in doing so, picks up insecticide and causes knockdown of the mosquito, kills it. Um, we can protect people extremely effectively when they sleep at night given that malaria carrying mosquitoes typically bite between 10 o'clock at night and two o'clock in the morning. So the $2 bed net, simple mechanical barrier, but with insecticide upon it is one of the most significant tools we can deploy. And the numbers are extremely well known in terms of impact. Somewhere between 200 to 1,000 nets will it distributed will equate to one life saved, um, depending upon the malaria burden of the area in which you're distributing nets. So let's call that 600 nets saves a life. If you imagine $2 a net and roughly $2 for the non-net costs, the shipping, uh, the registration of households, the distribution of the nets, you're looking at something around about two and a half thousand, three thousand, um, possibly up to $5,000 per life, depending upon the environment we're talking about. And I, I suggest we don't need to argue whether it's two, three, four, or $5,000. It's a very low number. Compare that, by the way, with what the National Health Service in the UK would spend on you to, um, uh, to give you one year of extra life. Um, it's around about £30,000. So we're talking about you know, really good value for money in terms of um, affecting people's lives and livelihoods. And the data is, um, there is significant data from many randomized controlled trials um, as to the impact of deploying nets. And here's a graph that shows what happens um, before we've distributed nets, the back line, a number of malaria cases shown across a 12-month period, rainy season on the left, dry season on the right, um, and the green line after we've distributed nets. And in any national environment, if you were to reduce by 10% a major disease, that would be a significant development. Well, we're talking about 40 to 50% declines in a matter of weeks, um, and certainly within a few months, and that can be sustained. So we're talking about a really simple way of making a significant difference on a big problem. Let me go back, if I may, just for a few minutes and give you some idea of um, what AMF is like and how we started. So I started AMF about 15 years ago, and I did that by inviting 250,000 of my closest friends to swim broadly on the same day all over the world to uh, fundraise and raise money that would all be used to buy nets. And it's we have a very grassroots feel, I'd like to suggest at AMF. We're not a big organization, as you'll come on to see. In fact, it was just two of us who ran it for, you know, for or involved with it for 10 years. Um, um, but I was very keen to make sure that it had this sort of wide appeal when I first started um, what became AMF. It was called World Swim Against Malaria at the time. 
And when I spoke to Michael Phelps, um, many of you or some of you may know he's one of the most decorated Olympic swimmers um, in the world. And my request to Michael was that he effectively say, I'm going to swim as part of World Swim Against Malaria. And it doesn't matter how fast I swim. When I swim, I count as one person. And if you swim, you count as one person. And so we're all the same. And uh, I was trying to get a million people to swim, in fact. Um, so I failed. Um, but I'm not going to beat myself up about that. But um, we didn't quite get to the numbers I would like to have got to. Um, something to do with Hurricane Katrina. Um, you know, if, if there's a question on that, happy to answer it. But um, I took a sort of 20 minute approach to launching World Swim. Um, in other words, how can I get a million people swimming in 20 minutes? Um, and I had a particular answer and approach to that, that question. And it helped us launch what became World Swim. And we had some wonderfully nutty people swimming in Serpentine Lake in the middle of Hyde Park in London. Um, uh, equally nutty people swimming in the English Channel, bottom left, and then some far more sensible people in Australia and in America on the right-hand side. But people swimming all over the world, particularly children, it was very important to me that as World Swim grew back in 2005, we had lots of schools and lots of children involved. Um, so imagine sort of dropping a pebble in a pond, you know, that, um, that pebble um, rippled out and we raised awareness, if you like, amongst not only the children involved and the teachers involved at schools, but also their parents and, and others. So there was a, um, a significant uh, sharing of information about malaria and what it does and what we can do to deal with it and fix it um, that we contributed to or started contributing to in, in 2005. So what we do, as you will have gathered by now, but I'll add to is that we provide long lasting insecticidal nets, we distribute them, we make sure they don't get stolen, which is pretty important. Um, there are some very good reasons why they would be stolen, which I perhaps come on to. We ensure they're used for the three years that they last. Um, typically, a mass distribution of nets countrywide will take place every three years and you replenish nets on that schedule. They don't last um, typically longer than that. Some do last five, six, seven years, but across millions of nets, you'll find that the percentage that survive you know, starts to decline in year three. And particularly, we negotiate with governments to ensure that we have data sitting at the heart of what we do. Um, I say slightly more politely than I'm about to put it, but when we work with um, ministries of health and governments, uh, we say, uh, please don't, don't ask us to trust you because we won't. But we won't ask you to trust us either. Let's just focus on the data. And in essence, that's what we do. So the contracts we have and the work we do is very, very focused on data, because in my view, it's the only way of ensuring that what goes on, what we want to have happen does happen. Um, and if it doesn't happen, finding out that it doesn't happen. Um, so you'll not be surprised to hear that our guiding principles are um, these four things, and I mentioned impact at the start, our very concise uh, description of the impact we seek to have is simply to prevent deaths from malaria and reduce illness from malaria, and that guides everything we do. And accountability is not just um, in terms of us reporting to donors, for example, um, it's ensuring that nets do get to the people who need them. Um, monitoring, monitoring them after they're used, and then various elements of transparency and efficiency. I'll give an example of, of a couple of these in a minute. Um, those are the sort of things that drive the choices and the decisions we make. If I look at accountability, first of all, um, there are two examples I could give of where accountability is extremely important to us. One is in country. So with the distribution partners we work with, which typically includes the Ministry of Health or the National Malaria Control Programme, which is that bit of the Ministry of Health that deals with malaria control. We focus on um, data from households, indeed every single household that will receive a net. So typically in our campaigns, millions of households worth of data. And if we focus on that data, we ensure nets get to the people who need them. And that inevitably leads to fewer malaria deaths and fewer people falling sick with malaria. And then on the other side, when we think of money coming into AMF, we link every single donation we receive to a specific net distribution. So we can show the donor exactly what has happened to 100% of the money that they have given us because it all buys nets um, with the exception of a very small number of donors that fund some other things that I'll come on to. So that we can say to a donor, um, your all of your money has bought this many nets to protect this many people, and they will be distributed in this particular location. And if you like, you can follow the progress of the nets from manufacturer through shipping um, to eventual distribution. 
So we hold ourselves, if you like, accountable to our donors in that way. And when we uh, raise the question internally, what information do we share with donors? Um, so this is, in a sense, talking to the point of transparency. Our, our question was, you know, how do we be transparent with our donors? What do we share? And our answer to that question, in a sense, was everything, or at least everything we can share. So here's an example of a, of a donor's private page. It's one that they can print tax receipts from, so it also works very um, effectively and efficiently administratively. But importantly, donors can see every single donation they've made. Um, the country flag shows where the donation uh, or the, the nets they've funded are going to be distributed and the state of the, um, the nets, whether at sea or being distributed or have been distributed, etc. Um, and that is an entirely automated system with us now. So across many, many tens of thousands of donors, all of this information is sort of instantly available to the donor and doesn't really require much of our time. So not only is this transparent, but it's also something that's extremely efficient for us as an organization. We're also um, pretty lean as an organization. Um, we were two people, uh, my colleague Andrew and I, for 10 years um, until about uh, five years ago. And we're now uh, nine people, um, eight full-time staff. Um, so still a very small team. And I, I suppose one of the reasons why we're small yet we can deal with quite a lot of money coming through AMF is because the design of what we do is really simple. People give us money, we buy nets, we distribute them. Clearly there's a lot of data that surrounds what we do and I'll come on to the challenges of operations in a minute because that's really where the key of our work is because we're never gonna mess up on how much money we raise. If we're gonna mess up, it's on operations. So you know, there's a lot of work that goes into making sure we deliver what we say we're gonna do. Um, but part of, the um, running of AMF has been significantly assisted by the support of many organizations um, who agreed to support us, and it's been pretty humbling their uh, support for us, um, largely perhaps because I was shameless in calling many organizations and saying, again, more politely than I'm about to put it, but not much, um, please will you help me, but I'm not going to pay you because you don't need five bucks as the cost of a net was then. Um, it's now two dollars as a net, as we saw you don't need five dollars more than a couple of kiddies in Africa need a bed net and I'm it's been again pretty humbling to have um, many organizations supporting us nobody has ever stepped away in 15 years and part of that is because we've um, approached organizations in a particular fashion with a particular strategy that's involved I suppose one of the things I would say is it's involved us not asking for too much because if you ask for too much then it might be that in you know next year or the year after an organization says look we can't keep on providing that sort of help because there will be a cost to the organization um so many organizations support us uh, it means that because of our simple design um and because we have very few costs in fact the only costs we have are the salaries of six staff members and, and that's it so we don't have any banking accounting legal office we have no offices uh, we all work from home, um, uh, website, um, translation, you name it, you know, we don't pay for it. Now, we could do, um, and it would probably cost us another half a million dollars a year or some other number, um, but it means that I don't have to go and raise that money, if you like, to, um, to, to fund it. Um, it just means that we don't have to take any money from what donors give us to cover that because those overheads are already covered by in fact, three private donors who've covered that in perpetuity. Um, uh, and, it's, and it's very low, it's about half percent of our revenue. So 99.5% of the money that we're given um, hits the front line and anything that anybody on this call or viewing this video you know, after today, 100% of the money that those individuals would give us would buy nets and would not go on anything else. So it's, it's quite efficient. Um, we work with co-funding partners. So we fund the nets, other people fund the non-net costs. Um, funding non-net costs involves putting together budgets and monitoring work in country and we're just not set up as an organization to do that um, strategically we've chosen not to be there are many organizations that are um, and so um, you know partnerships are really important um, and we work with distribution partners as I've mentioned governments but other organizations um, uh, as well who monitor the work that goes on around distributing nets efficiency there's an example here that might seem rather dry, or perhaps is rather dry, um, but it's really important to us because, you know, in many organizations, we're no exception. There's an awful lot of um, 
admin that has to be done, um, including reporting at the end of the financial year, in our case in 12 countries, because we're a registered charity in 12 countries. Um, and that used to take four people at PricewaterhouseCoopers um, about three weeks to you know, put all our accounts together and many documents surrounding um, uh, uh, you know, the accounting uh, material we had to provide to auditors and others. Uh, and that was you know, very efficiently done. Um, that now is done in nine hours, and therefore we have all of our accounts and all of the associated documentation within nine hours of the end of our financial year. And as I often say, that is because I'm, uh, it's nine because I'm asleep for seven of them. So I wake up and finish off the, uh, the commentary that goes in the report and then documents go out to, um, in a sense, 15 documents to 12 countries because we've automated the living daylights out of the whole process um, such that I took this screenshot um, just a few minutes ago on our website um, under the transparency section we can show our real-time financial accounts live on our website which um, we hope you know is of interest well, we'll we know is of interest to some people perhaps it you know will um, allow people to have a you know high level of confidence in what we do because we're very open and transparent in in what we demonstrate but most importantly, what it does is it allows us to be incredibly efficient. So I'm not expending time at the end of a financial year, as I would have to, focusing on admin. I can focus on the work we need to do to help people in the African countries where we, where we do our work. An example of what we do um, um, is, I've chosen here, is in, in the Cheo district in Malawi. And very simply, what we've done is provided 270,000 nets to north of half a million people who lived in uh, or live in about 110,000 households. So with our partners, we went to 110,000 households. Um, data collectors collected information we required to establish whether individual household needed two, three, four, five, or however many nets to protect everybody sleeping inside. And we sent um, a second wave of data collectors in to check the data collected by the first data collectors and we told the first wave of data collectors, this is what we're gonna do, not because we don't trust you, because we don't do trust. We just want to make sure we've got the evidence to suggest that the data you've collected is accurate and we'll compare that 5% overlap and that will ensure that, um, you know, it's a very cost-effective way, a very simple way of making sure the data we're basing the distribution of nets upon is accurate. And in a sense, as many of you will be able to calculate, it means that we do not revisit 95% of the households. So in essence, this is psychology, effectively encouraging data collectors to make sure they do a really good job of collecting very accurate data. Um, so that's one of a number of things we do to make sure that the data that is being collected um, is good information because, you know, garbage in, garbage out, we've got to make sure that we've got you know, good data. We monitor um, nets after they've been distributed and every six or nine months we go back into a significant number of households with partners that we pay to do this monitoring work and we fund that um, to uh, allow us to understand the coverage level of sleeping spaces over time because it does change. It does come down over time because nets become worn out, you know, for one reason or another. Um, and that data not only gives us a picture of what we would call the decline curve over three years, but it's also useful information that can drive actions and improve malaria control. Because in a, a particular uh, health district that might have, in, in, in particular, this case it is 37 health center catchment areas, the district health officer um, has limited resources and she can decide to say to the person in charge of malaria control, why don't we spend time in these nine areas rather than you know, the other um, 28? Because those are the nine where we would do the most good in increasing net hang up and net usage um, you know, for one reason and another. So post-distribution monitoring is extremely important for us to track um, uh, coverage levels over time and know how we're doing. We don't just distribute nets and walk away. Accountability for us um, works, you know, sort of in another way as well. We're very happy to be held to account by others. And, um, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to, you know, people interested in the effective altruism movement. In a sense, AMF is a child of EA, if you like. Um, the effective altruism movement has been phenomenal in supporting what we've done. And of the 
Uh, Dewey mentioned the $345 million we've raised in our history, of which a quarter of a billion dollars has been raised in the last four years. And at least half of the money we've received has come from EA. So, you know, more than $150 million. And that's often come in $5 and $10 and 20 Swiss francs and 30 euros, you know, from a lot of people. Um, and, and it's obviously very helpful for us when a third party says nice things about us, um, uh, because then there's a degree of independence. So it's been extremely important for our growth. And that growth, um, cumulatively, is shown here. And it's no coincidence that the, the area in red um, is red. Um, it is our bedrock, our lifeblood, if you like. And it's, if I may say, it's all of us giving, it's people like us giving you know, these sort of more modest donations um, that is you know, what sustains us. And then on top of that, the second type of donor we have is every now and again, we get a very large donation in that will run into millions, multiple millions. And that's a total punch the air moment, as you can imagine, when we get a million dollar donation in, because it means we can buy 500,000 nets that will protect a million people. And it's absolutely brilliant. But that doesn't happen without the red bit. Um, and so uh, it's really important that that we, you know, we hope people understand that every two dollars matters. It doesn't matter, you know, what the donation amount is, because we have got a significant funding gap ahead of us right now. Um, you know, we've got an immediate funding gap. We talk about on our on our website. It sits at about twenty five million dollars now. It will go substantially north of that soon, and we could spend that immediately. And every two dollars means we can add another net, and we we can protect a, you know, two more two more people. Um, other numbers that are you know relevant in our world are that five hundred dollars protects a village um, effectively, and two to three thousand dollars, four thousand dollars saves a life and averts a thousand cases of malaria. Those are the sort of numbers that um, uh, uh, are relevant to to us at AMF. Our progress over the 15 years or so has been in three phases. We had a, a first phase where we raised one to $2 million a year. And then um, almost coincident with um, effective altruism um, starting, uh, give well the life you can save, uh, giving what we can. We increased our revenues to uh, five to $15 million in that period. And then we jumped up again um, in 2016 and we were in the tens of millions dollar category. And that meant we could do much more and we could persuade, we were more effective at persuading governments and ministries of health to adopt accountability measures that we felt were so important in doing our work. So, um, you know, 10 years in, we really kicked on. Um, and it's been, uh, you know, very rewarding to see some of the, uh, some of the results of, of our work in the last few years. This year has been uh, has been extremely good, and we're about to go through $100 million raised this year. Um, so that's another milestone. Whether we'll keep that up in years to come, um, we'll see. Uh, we'll try very hard. But what that translates to in terms of impact is, um, and that shouldn't say September 2020 at the top of the slide uh, in the, in the uh, table on the right, it should say um, March 2021. The number of deaths averted by all of us, if you like, it's not just the team at AMF, it's the donors, it's the um, partners we have in country, you know, so everybody involved. This isn't just sort of nine people doing this, it's a very large number of people, so it really is a team effort. Um, the sort of numbers we, we can relatively confidently point to are deaths averted, some 120,000, once we've distributed all the nets that we can fund, so that's not sort of as of, you know, today. Malaria cases averted, 120 million, people protected, close to 300 million. Um, and I mentioned right at the top that there's an economic benefit of, of fixing malaria, and it runs to roughly 12 times the amount of money we've put in play. And so we're talking about a number of billions of dollars worth of support, um, uh, you know, which has been important. So last four or five years have been, um, been very interesting for our, our growth. And it means that we can fund millions of nets at a time. Um, we fund a significant proportion of the nets that go to the countries we work in. Um, and that means that we have a more significant, you know, a larger literal and metaphorical seat at the table, if you like, when we're um, talking about accountability measures and um, sharing data and um, hopefully 
you know, persuading our partners that, that you know, some of the measures that we wish to uh, deploy you know, are deployed in country. Um, much easier when you're funding 10 million nets than if you're funding a million. So scale has been incredibly important to AMF over the last five years. And that's a, a real um, tipping point for us in terms of the um, impact we've been able to have. A few slides on challenges. Um, they are a plenty. I mentioned uh, um, a few moments ago that operations is really um, where it's at for us. We've got to get that right. And we don't control things. We work with partners where we're looking to persuade, cajole, encourage. Um, our span of control is, is only so far. I mean, arguably putting millions of household records um, with data collected on paper into a database because that data is useless if it, useless if it sits on paper. You, know, you can't analyze that and see what's going on. You've really got to put it into a database. Um, fortunately, we don't really have to do much of that anymore because data is collected on smartphones um, even in some of the most challenging environments, as a slide right at the end will um, will almost conclude with. But many challenges of doing our work operationally, um, uh, and we a key job we have is identifying really good partners. Because if you identify really good partners with outstanding leadership, then when issues come up and problems occur, the attitude is one of fixing it, not blame. Um, and that's a really important dynamic in the work we do, is we sit around a round table. You know, we're not there to sort of cast blame. And in fact, we say to our partners, if things go wrong, when they come to us and say this has gone wrong, the first thing we say is thank you, because it's really important to encourage a culture of sharing what's gone wrong, um, which for some cultures can be difficult because they like, you know, to be seen as getting everything right. Um, because if we know something's gone wrong, we don't blame anybody. We go, that's brilliant. We can now fix it now that we know. Um, and hopefully it'll make us better in, you know, us all better in, in not happening, happening again or happening next time. So a really important part of sort of operationally improving uh, sort of all the time. Because we don't think we've got answers to all the questions. You know, there are always things that come up we have to fix with our partners. Um, one of the challenges that we've all faced recently, as Darwin would have warned us um, or did warn us, warn us is um, you know, survival of the fittest. Survival of those mosquitoes that develop a resistance to the insecticide we use on the nets. And that's occurred, is occurring. And so we're developing new tools. And there is a new net called a PBO net uh, needed, a randomized controlled trial, which we fully funded. In effect, we put about eight and a half million dollars into that, um, or several donors did and agreed to sort of fund that. Um, and that allowed us over a couple of years um, to gather incredibly strong data of sort of incontrovertible arguably data that told us that these new type of nets were um, about 25 20 to 25% more effective in particular environments and therefore that net is now used um, extensively in Africa where before we did the trial I think we were globally producing I say we as in the malaria control community if you like we're producing you know hundreds of thousands of nets a month of PBO nets. I think the capacity is now at 10 million nets a month. So it's just absolutely taken off because the data is now there to show that these nets work in XYZ environments. So that was a challenge that we have faced, but are still facing. Funding is a massive challenge for us. Um, every now and again, I have to make some really nasty decisions by turning around to countries and saying, I'm sorry, but we can't fund um, your gap. And that means that people will sleep at night in areas where there are malaria carrying mosquitoes. And if I um, was to very quietly open your bedroom door and release 10 malaria carrying mosquitoes in it and then close your door, you would not be happy about that at all. That is the reality of what millions of people go through. It's as simple as that. So these are nasty decisions. Um, and you know that alone is enough to keep us doing what we're doing at AMF um, to try and close these funding gaps so we can protect people when they sleep at night. Um, and so that challenge of a lack of funding can be flipped into an opportunity. We've got a fantastic opportunity to fund millions of nets at a time over the coming few years, which is our horizon we're looking at at the moment, in a series of countries to protect you know millions of people. I mentioned um, uh, just in conclusion, you know data gathering and smartphones. And technology not only provides us with lots of opportunities in terms of how we run the charity, but also how we gather data in the field. And this is one of my favorite images of the location of almost a quarter of a million households that received nets a few years ago. 
in one of the most challenging environments in the world, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, that sort of is, is literally being shot to pieces, you know, wars and, you know, all sorts of problems in DRC, one of the poorest countries in the world, you know, when you look at GDP per capita and many other, um, you know, metrics, yet we can deliver terrific accountability of where we have deployed the nets funded by the money entrusted to us. Um, so, you know, lots of opportunities to be really efficient and provide lots of accountability, even in some of the, um, even in the very challenging environments we, we work in. So finally, if we were to hover up to 50,000 feet and look at what's happened to malaria control and malaria deaths over the last 15 years, we've done, um, we as in the global community have done a, a decent job, you know, perhaps a B or a B plus, um, not drifting into the A category or A star category thus far, I'm afraid. Um, and a significant proportion of the reduction um, in deaths has been due to bed nets, um, two thirds to three quarters in that in that uh, area. And we're talking about a problem that is is not insuperable. We can eliminate malaria, um, and malaria has been eliminated from Sri Lanka. You know, it's a it's a it's a decent sized island. Um, you know, that had a lot of malaria, but three three years of no native cases of malaria meant that um, Sri Lanka was declared malaria free in 2017 and a whole raft of countries, some smaller, some in, in South America and Central America where there is less malaria uh, and fewer malaria cases than in, in, in Africa. Um, but we can get to that point because you can drive malaria out of a village, out of a sub-district, out of a district, um, because a mosquito has a two kilometer fly zone, you know, eminently doable. And, and that's the work we're you know, involved in. But a child still dies from malaria every 60 seconds, 90 seconds. So, you know, our job is not yet done. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to keep going to try and raise the next, you know, X hundred million if we can. I've taken a little bit longer than I um, anticipated, and I hope that's been okay with everybody, but uh, I've added a little bit of colour to some of the slides. But I will pause now, and thank you for listening, and very happy to take questions. Excellent. That was, that was excellent. Really, really great. Thank you very much. Um, very inspiring. That was, that was awesome. Um, cool, so we'll move now to a uh, Q&A. Uh, so if you have any, any questions, uh, you are welcome to either post your question in the chat and I will, I will read it out. Um, I'll just make that possible now. Um, yeah, uh, so you can post the question in the chat or you can post the word question and I will then unmute you and you can ask your, your question verbally. Um, yeah, so while, while you are all uh, writing out your questions, uh, maybe I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, yeah, what, what has surprised you the most from your, or what is one of the most surprising things that you've found in your 16 years of, of running uh, Against Malaria Foundation? That's an interesting question. Um, many things. I think one of the things that's been most rewarding is, um, and pretty humbling, is the support I've had from many people that I've approached and said, please help me, but I'm not going to pay you. Um, I mean, there's some strategy and, and some thinking behind who you approach and how you approach people. But whether it's, you know, I run this from the you know back room of my house, you know, London where I live. And, and that potentially could cause donors to think, hang on a minute, you know, how robust is this organization, you know, going back to, you know, 15 years ago when we first started. Um, but I approached PwC and Citibank and Microsoft and approached individuals within that organization and said, please help. I can't do this on my own. I need so much help in, you know, the registering of the charity to a lovely lady called Keris who worked at Allen and Overy who said, I'll do that. I'll set up the charity. I'll do the paperwork. And she was one of the first people that said, who stuck her hand up and said, I'll help. Um, many, many translators, you know, came forward and said, I'll do all the translating for free. Um, and I suppose that's, if, if I'd have surprised in the sense that I didn't really think about it, and perhaps if I'd stopped to think about what I was embarking upon, which is getting an awful lot of support and not paying for it, maybe I, if I was a little bit more intelligent, I would have thought about it and cautioned myself to not go down that path. Um, but that's been one of the most surprising um, and fabulous things about, you know, AMF's development and the fact that nobody's ever stepped away. Um, you know, we've gained that we've continued to receive that support where we've needed it. Excellent. Uh, Ahum has messaged me with a question uh, asking, uh, 
Yeah, you mentioned that uh, nets are being stolen, uh, and this is like perhaps one of the one of the big issues that you face. Um, and is there any like operational work being done to try to prevent this, or what kind of work is being done to, to try to prevent this? Well, really, the work that's done at the heart of what we do sort of is, in a sense, is aimed at preventing it. Because I start from the basis when we sort of manage things and plan for things is assume things will go wrong, things will get stolen, stuff will happen. You know, working on that assumption to um, therefore drive the actions we take and how we do things. So um, the sort of theft that can occur, uh, and I should I should say that in AMF's history, we've had one set of 300 nets stolen and not recovered. And we've had most recently 45,000 nets stolen out of 4.8 million. So it's less than 1%. And if we were to do something in a developing country and achieve 99% success, everybody would say that's pretty good. So in some of the challenging environments in Africa, achieving 99% success would be still pretty darn good. Um, but 45,000 went missing. They were recovered. They've all come back to where they were meant to be. They've all been or are being distributed. So the net result is zero went missing. But our systems, if you like, um, plus the actions we took when we discovered, oi, oi, something's wrong here, meant that we could, you know, we could deal with that and recover the nets in that particular situation. And we learned some things because always when things go wrong, um, the most important thing is okay what do we learn from this that either makes it more difficult for that to happen again or if it does happen and this is what we learned from this particular situation the labels of our nets were cut off and in fact we found the cut off labels which is what indicated to us that our nets would be stolen we then found the nets and so what we do now is we we sew the label um, and it's fine for me to share this because even if somebody who wanted to be nefarious and steal a whole bunch of nets you know we're facing them with a challenge we now print the batch number of the net on the label that is under the stitching so you can't just cut the label off now you'd have to cut the label out and that means putting a hole in the net and not many people are going to do that and that means that if nets ever do go missing again because they probably will because that's life in some quantity we will have an ability to know um, when we find the nets or when we find the labels because the batch number is on both um, where those nets were stolen from, you know, which particular sub-locations, sub-sub-sub-locations. So we learned something from that. Um, there are three sorts of um, theft um, in my eyes. Container loads, 40,000 nets at a time or multiples thereof. That's organized crime. That's corruption at a deep level. Um, 10,000 nets on a truck leaving from A to go to B and only 7,000 arrive and 2,000 nets arriving in a location where a series of villages and villagers are going to receive nets and a bale, 200 nets, two bales of 100 nets going missing. Now we buy nets at $2 each, 100 nets in a bale, $200. On the black market, it fetches six to $900 because there is a black market. Now, if you're a health worker, you're earning $150 a month. So you're looking at 100, bale, 100 nets in a bale, which is the size of a chair, and that's four to six months money. It's a totally understandable decision that somebody might wish to remove them. And so we have to, our work is at this granular household level. So we know exactly how many nets are going to go to um, a village, a distribution point, And we have, you know, double signatories on manifests, um, you know, shipping manifests and lorry manifests when they leave a warehouse, when they arrive at the next warehouse, all of that has to be um, effectively, you know, photographed or scanned and sent to us. And we have a database that follows all of that. And so we pick things up really quickly. Nets have to be counted in and out. Again, a series of, if we all sat around a table and said, how do we do this? We've never done it before. 95% of what we would do, we just come up with by, through the application of common sense. And that's what we do. And so we, you know, we, we minimize. I'm never going to say we remove the risk of theft but we minimize it. And in our history, we've had, you know, incredibly few occasions where we've had problems um, and we have the data to prove it as well. And that was really important to me in setting up AMF in being not paranoid, but as close to paranoid as one could be without being paranoid about 
all the stuff that could go wrong and absolutely making sure that in the management and the operations of what we do, we do stuff that just designs it out or makes it incredibly difficult to occur. And that's the most fundamental thing we do. So in, in some ways, the question you've just asked is one of the most fundamental ones that we have to you know, think about at AMF. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, Katie has messaged uh, saying she has a question, so I've unmuted her. Hi, Katie. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. It was really great. Um, I have two questions. I, I don't speak, know. speak up a bit, Katie, because I can only hear you softly. Um, okay, I'll just lean into my laptop. Is that Thank any you. better? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, one question I have is: um, Do you think it's possible to eradicate malaria from Africa? just using the bed nets approach or do we need research and vaccines and stuff? I think the short answer to that is um, no. I don't think it's possible to eradicate just through bed use. Well, yes, it is possible, but I don't think it will happen that way. I think eradication will occur either as a result of a vaccine or a gene drive technology solution, um, both of which I think we could probably call the sort of silver bullet. Um, you know, we don't have a COVID-esque solution at the moment, you know, with variants of COVID notwithstanding. Um, I think we can go an awfully long way with bed nets if they are fully funded and used well and replenished at the correct times. I think we can do a huge amount to take many countries from a situation where they have malaria out of control or at very high levels to control and at lower, more manageable levels and then you've got that sort of tail of, you know, sort of driving sort of asymptotically to zero takes more time. But, you know, you know, then there's sort of you've got a, an annoyance in the health system and people being affected. And I don't wish to diminish you know, the impact on any individual who suffers from malaria. But, you know, at a country level, the number of people would be much lower and it's much easier to deal with. So I, I think, yes, possible. No, in reality fervently hoping that there will be in the coming years something that is a sort of game changer um, or at least helps us move much more quickly to eradication in a whole series of areas. Thank you. Um, I had a second question. Shall I go for it or should I let someone else? Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could um, say a little bit more about your kind of journey as a founder. Like, was this something that you were kind of planning to do or was it, did it just sort of happen organically? Um, and, and what was it like founding a charity? It happened um, by accident. Um, I'm useless with a remote control of a television and I was trying to turn off the BBC News at 10.30 at night one evening back in 2003 and switched channels to ITV and saw the image of a five-year-old melted child inside a plastic Wendy house making pretend cups of tea for the cameraman and watched the next hour um, streaming. I'm not ashamed to say I was incredibly moved by it. And that in a sense led to AMF being founded, you know, bizarrely because I called a couple of mates and said, let's get in a swimming pool and swim a distance equivalent to the English channel because I'm not brave enough or fit enough to do the real thing. Um, you know, let's raise some money for this little girl called Terry. Um, she's been through, you know, suffered 90% burns in a house fire. You know, do something to try and help her. And that led, as Dewey mentioned at the start, to, uh, you know, three people, three guys swimming to 10,000 people swimming all over the world for a little girl to live 40 miles from London in Ipswich. And then somebody said to me, what are we doing next year? And to get a lovely man called Walter Cole off the telephone, I said, oh, I don't know, maybe we'll get a million people to swim and I didn't really believe that but he said um, he said terrific that means we only need 999,998 more people because I'm in and I went away and I thought I wonder if I could get a million people to do something broadly on the same day and that led me to as I mentioned on one of the slides to launching World Swim and seeing if I could get a million people to swim and and I started approaching I started by approaching 20 companies um, asking if they would get, or 20 organizations, I should say, asking if they would give me 5,000 people each to swim, um, thinking that if I did that, that's 100,000, that's a credible platform to launch and see if I can get a million people to swim and give it a, give it a go, see what happens. 
and, and that's what did happen. I got 100,000 people to swim. And, you know, strategically, I approached Speedo when I had 60,000 people, 12 organizations, including the British Army and Aussie Masters Swimming and USA Triathlon and New Zealand Secondary School Sports Council and a variety of other people. And strategically approached, approached a lovely man called Simon Ryder, who was president of Speedo at the time, and said, you know, can I come and talk to you? I've got 60,000 people to swim. And I met with him and he said, uh, swimming, global, terrific cause, no brainer, we're in. And how much money do you want? And I said, don't want any money, Simon. I just want 5,000 people swimming. And in a sense that, you know, gave me, you know, in inverted commas, um, almost every Olympic gold medalist swimmer in the world, given Speedo, you know, was and still is, you know, an extremely significant swimming brand. Um, and so, you know, there was some thinking and some strategy behind it, um, but very grassrootsy in the way it grew. Um, so if I hadn't been useless with a remote control, I'd probably be doing something else now. But one thing led to another. We ended up with, you know, halfway through planning World Swim in 2005, 130,000 people signed up. And when, when, when I went with one of our trustees, um, lovely man called Richard Lane, across to uh, the Global Fund in Geneva, um, the Global Fund are a major funder of um, uh, control activities for AIDS, TB and malaria. Um, uh, an individual called Christophe said to me, do you realize with 130,000 people swimming, you are the largest advocacy group in the world for malaria? And I said, are you telling me that 20 phone calls out of the back room of my house in London have created the world's largest advocacy group for the world's single largest killer of children. And he said, yes. And I said, well, shame on all of us if that's the case. And I guess that was another sort of incentive for me to say, you know, I wonder how far we can go here. And when we finished World Swim in 2005, because my original plan was to try and get a million people to do something and go back and get a proper job, go back into my previous life. Um, you know, very kindly, PwC and Microsoft and Citibank and many other people said, you can't, you can't stop this now. You've got to keep going. And so we became AMF, Against Malaria Foundation, because a lot of people wanted to do other things than swim and give us money. So we dropped the world swim bit and became Against Malaria. Um, and, and, you know, we're now 13, 14 years on from that. So it was, it was, it was a, an accident, Katie. It wasn't planned. Um, but I guess, in, you know, inside of me was always a desire to that old cliche sort of give back i always felt i'd been extremely fortunate in my you know in my career and educationally and all the rest of it and i've always had a very keen sense of the sort of haves and have nots and that that will always you know be the case um uh but i you know i wanted to see if i could you know do something to help when it came to malaria so that was the sort of accidental genesis of it awesome uh, I think David has two questions. I'll unmute him now. Hi, David. Hi. Uh, thanks. Yeah, that was that was great. Um, my first question is the the number that surprised me the most, or one of the numbers that surprised me the most, was you were saying that there are a thousand cases averted for every life saved, and that seems like a very big number to me. And I know it's really hard to work with things like quality adjusted life years, but it seems to me the impact of the avoided cases could actually be a lot greater than the lives saved even. Uh, and certainly I've heard less about that aspect of the benefit than the, the save, saved lives. Have you tried to estimate those numbers? Um, we've not gone into them in sort of greater detail. I think it's a fair um, question, David, that um, the WHO used the number most recently of 500 cases of malaria per death. Yeah, um, not a thousand, but it does vary significantly. And, you know, there is data where you're looking at, you know, 2000 cases or more of malaria for one death. Um, and that's in environments where you can get drugs to people quite quickly. And so the number of deaths is really quite low. Um, so mortality is right down, but morbidity is still you know, a problem. Um, it is the case that uh, many people who fall sick with malaria will recover, um, uh, even without drugs. Um, you know, ACTs, artemisinin combination therapy, because they're, you know, teenagers or they're older people that have got some, you know, level of capacity and they've got, you know, immune systems that can deal with it. Um, so it's a, a fair question as to whether actually the number is, you know, is lower than a thousand. 
Um, we tend to pick that number because it's it sort of sits broadly in the middle of what we hear about, but it's a fair critique um, that maybe we should include a number that's half as big and go with the WHO numbers. Um, uh, I don't wish to infer any criticism of WHO at all because gathering data, you know, is extremely challenging at times. You know, particularly in in Africa where systems are not as strong as as they might be in the future. Um, and you know there is some evidence that the the death numbers, the mortality numbers, are 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 higher than the numbers that the WHO report because they've got to, um, you know, perhaps err on the side of being more conservative. So, okay, uh, yeah. So, sorry, I, I, isn't it, um, I wasn't meaning to question that ratio particularly, but just to ask, um, essentially, how serious is the typical case of malaria? And is the, if you like, the benefit to humanity of avoiding a thousand cases actually greater than avoiding one death? Yes, it is. Sorry if I misunderstood the question. Yes, um, uh, when somebody falls sick, they can be sort of knocked out for, you know, typically a week or more, depending on when they get drugs, um, you know, to deal with malaria, three day course of malaria, or it can be as much as three weeks. And that is really what um, talks to the economic point I made in that when people are sick, they can't teach dry and farm function. Yeah. An economic impact, um, you know, let alone the fact that you know you might have to have you know mum or a dad staying home looking after somebody who's particularly sick. Um, it's more that economic impact that it has, and that's what um, Jeff Sachs did some work. Um, albeit this goes back, you know, 15 years or more now. Um, um, economic impact of malaria, and the ratio that was sort of come up with was that for every million dollars you spend. Um, effectively fighting malaria, you improve the GDP of the continent by about 12 million. Now, that number, frankly, could be six or it could be 20. Um, again, it's, you know, it's, is it 600 nets saves a life or 400 or 1,000? You know, I'm very happy to, you know, to debate the point. I don't think it changes anything that we do in terms of, you know, our actions, and there is some degree of estimate in these numbers. But uh, yes, you're right that the sickness has a huge impact um, measured and estimated economically. Yeah, thanks. Um, second question, hopefully, is going to be quicker to answer because I think you're going to say you can't tell me. But I was very curious why the income for this year, even though we're only three or four months in, is already two and a half times what it was in most of the previous years, 98 million. I'm curious to know who gave that and how it happened. Yeah, uh, interesting question. So we're we're actually, our year end is June uh, 30th. So oh, okay. So we're, it, we're nine months in now, but, but this question is still valid because um, at this stage last year, I think we'd raised about 35 million and so far we've raised 99 million. Um, that's come from, I suppose, three or four different factors. The first is that we've got this, if you remember back to the graph I showed with the sort of the blood red element um, of, of support, that has continued to grow at about you know, 20 plus percent per year. Um, in other words, the people who give five dollars and 30 Swiss francs and 20 euros and so on, that sort of has continually, that's grown year on year. And what we've seen is a very high level of donor retention. So very few people, pe people do, you know, give and then decide they've given enough to AMF perhaps and, um, and move away. But we have a very significant proportion, a very high percentage of people that continue to give year on year, which helps in driving that growth, and we have more people that discover us and decide that AMF is a good place to donate to. Um, we then have, um, uh, this year we've had um, a modest increase in the number of people that have given um, significant sums, so you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, multiple hundreds of thousands, millions, multiple millions, and so that's contributed to the increase. On top of that, we've had two large amounts that we received in uh, about six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, we had a donor in California who gave us a $20 million donation. Oh, okay. um, now we did have a $20 million donation or $23 million donation. It was part of our numbers in 2016 when we raised $49 million during the year. So it's not something that's um, never happened before, but that's a pretty amazing moment. And if I may just um, add, add, you know, bring, bring some sort of, um, some colour to that, I'd ask my colleague Andrew to go and check in our accounts and our bank statements whether a $7,800 donation had come in because it was being um, uh, requested by a donor whether we received it and so Andrew went in and took a screenshot of our account statement and sent it to me and it had the number 20 million and he said 
is this what you were looking for? And so I didn't quite fall off my chair, but I, I sort of did inside. Um, totally unexpected, totally unknown, um, or, you know, not, not expected. And so, you know, you can imagine that was, that was an amazing, amazing moment because it means we can protect another 20 million people with that, that donation. And GiveWell were allocating $47 million. They'd had a particularly, uh, I think, strong run and they had $47 million of discretional uh, donations to allocate and we received $28 million of that. So in those two, uh, because we've got a particularly significant need that's very time sensitive and blah, blah, blah. So almost 50 million of the, um, of the 99 um, has come in through sort of, you know, two amounts, if you like, albeit the 28 million is made up of more than 12,000 donations from lots of people. So, and in the past we've had a, you know, a $15 million allocation or a $6 million, you know, of a small amount. There was a much larger amount that sat at GiveWell this year. And, and we, you know, uh, thankfully were the recipient. So that otherwise we would be, at sort of 50 million versus 35. So we'd yeah. still be significantly up. And what I don't know, David, is whether we'll repeat that. Um, you know, at AMF, we have no budget. Um, you know, I don't set a budget each year because we can only spend the money that's given to us. So I don't need to do any budgeting. You know, I can't, I can't allocate and make legal agreements with countries and commit to fund nets unless I've got the money in the bank. Um, so it just means that we can do, you know, some, we can fill, a lot more gaps, you know, so that 25 million gap at the moment would be way, way higher at the moment if we hadn't had in that 50 million, because if you do go and look at the website on our transparency section and our immediate funding gap, you'll see there's a sort of history page that shows that recently our funding gap was 72 million. Mm. Um, so it all gets put, put to work. So uh, not a shorter answer, because I'm very happy to answer that question. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. <laughs>